Okay. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Peña. I'm from ARM. Um, this is session is the data center networking. Uh, our next uh, invited speaker is Gilad Shainer, who is a senior vice president of networking NVIDIA. He serves as a chairman of the HPC AI Advisory Council organization. He's also the president of the UCF consortium. He's a member of the IBTA and a contributor to the PCI SIG, PCIX, and PCIA specifications. He holds multiple patents in the field of high speed networking. He's a recipient of the 2015 RD award for his contribution to the Core Direct in Network Computing Technology and the 2019 RD 100 award for his contribution to UCX or Unified Communication X Technology. He holds a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Technion Institute of Technology in Israel. And welcome, Gilad, and you can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. Um, if I knew that you're going to read it, I would probably just send one, one, one sentence. Um, let me share this screen. There we go. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's all good. Thank you very much. So uh, the next next uh, few minutes, we'll talk about we'll talk about cloud native supercomputing or cloud native supercomputing platform, um, and we'll see how it actually that actually ties into into interconnects. Um, so looking looking uh, looking uh, in in the increased uh, usage of AI, for example, uh, the wave of AI, uh, the increased usage, usage of simulations, uh, the increased complexity of the problems that we want to solve, uh, the things that we want to simulate uh, and so forth. We're seeing two things that are happening. Um, on, on one hand, there is a need to continue and in increasing the performance that we can get from supercomputers. And obviously that includes capabilities that are coming um, from GPUs, coming from CPUs, um, as well as coming from the network. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's happening on the network side uh, in particular for the overall system performance. And on the other side, um, since we see that every company in the future will need to have access to supercomputing. Uh, every company in, a per, in, in every company in the world will run AI, which means that every company will need access to supercomputing. Uh, we will have more users, more users and more application that needs to be hosted on supercomputers. Supercomputers is not something that everyone can build. Uh, and the four on one side, there is a need to increase the performance capabilities of the system that we build. On the other side, we need to be able to serve more and more users and more and more applications, essentially enabling supercomputing as a service. And that means that we need to merge cloud services on one side or more infrastructure services on one side and increasing performance or bare metal performance from the other side. Um, and to that combination, we call cloud native supercomputing. So the combination of bare metal performance or accelerated bare metal performance on one side and ability to um, provide supercomputing as a service, supporting many users in a secured and isolated manner. Now, the foundation, the foundation of building or enabling this new architecture of cloud native supercomputing, essentially it's, it's completely focused on the network. Um, and the network, uh, if in the past was uh, an, a medium to be able to move data from one side to another side, now the network actually becomes a new computing platform. It's not just moving data from one side to another side, and obviously it's doing that uh, very effectively, but it has become a new computing platform a new computing platform for the data center infrastructure. Um, it's like, you know, looking or, or trying to have a, a simple example. It's like the changes that happens to the phones that we have. 
So in, in the past, we used the phone just to make calls. Now I still hold the phones and sometimes I do make calls with it, but it's a com complete computer by itself. And we need this new computing infrastructure or we need this new computing platform in order to support new kind of services in order to support increasing performance capabilities in order to support more users and more applications on the same infrastructure without sacrificing or, or reducing performance from the supercomputer capabilities, from, from the super, supercomputer uh, elements. The cloud native supercomputing platform utilizing the new computing platform, which is the network, enable a more sophisticated in-network computing capabilities, which means the ability to offload more element and run them in more effective way on the network, enabling computational storage, um, adaptive performance isolation, enhanced telemetry to do things that we could not do before, and enabling or moving the, the data centers or moving supercomputers towards uh, zero trust. So if we go and look on the components that enable uh, that enable cloud native supercomputing, um, we have the switch devices, and here I'm I'm showcasing the latest uh, uh, InfiniBand platform. Um, we have the quantum two InfiniBand switches, switches that not just uh, increase the radix and and going to 400 gigabit per second per port extremely low latency and extremely low latency. We're talking about 200 nanosecond latency per switch, uh, which there, there is nothing, nothing out there that get even close to that. Um, and including in-network computing, including hardware engines that can do data reductions, for example, data aggregations at the switch level. The Connectx7 uh, adapters, um, and moving, actually moving from Connectex, uh, uh, Connectex adapters to Bluefield, to the DPU, to the data processing units. The data processing units, those are the devices that uh, on one side include all of the Connectex IP, so it's a full NIC by itself, plus multiple ARM cores and a data path accelerators and memory and so forth. Actually, the heart, the heart of the, the new computing, the new computing platform. Um, also, there is a gateway that seamlessly connects between InfiniBand and Ethernet, able to move data from uh, InfiniBand on one side to Ethernet on the other side, and vice versa. Uh, simple, a simple connectivity, simple way to connect uh, the, the compute network, for example, the InfiniBand compute network into the enterprise uh, or, or management or control Ethernet uh, connectivity. Um, and, and UFM, which is a full set of software elements for monitoring, management, orchestration. Uh, UFM appliances also runs AI frameworks that are looking for uh, anomalies, data centers, anomalies, uh, that's from a security perspective, and frameworks that uh, enabling predictive maintenance, meaning collecting information, analyzing information over time, looking for performance degradations over time, doing correlations and be able to provide alerts of elements that uh, should be fixed kind of before they, they, they fail. So enabling predictive maintenance. One of the, the important parts on the network is what we call in-network computing. Um, and in-network computing transform the network from just being a medium that move data from one side to another side to a medium that actually uh, forms a new computing platform, a new computing platform for the data center infrastructure. So on the switch side, I, many, uh, I mentioned already some of the attributes that actually related to the network itself. It's a 64 ports of 400, the 128 ports of 200, 200 nanosecond latency again, um, and the ability to do data, data reductions on the switch ASIC small message data reduction, so large message data reduction, ability to support multiple reduction trees concurrently, virtually unlimited uh, reduction trees running concurrently on the switch, supporting multiple applications that each can have its own data reduction tree. 
So it, with that ability to run, reduce, and all reduce, and bury and broadcast, for example, completely on the network, reducing latencies dramatically, is increasing the throughput, uh, and so forth. Doing data reductions on the switch network means that you can save at least half of the bandwidth on the network, at least half of the bandwidth. 400 gigabit per second uh, infinibit switch with data reduction on it is better than 800 gigabit per second switch without data reductions. That's a huge impact. Um, Connectx7 and then Bluefield, I'd like to focus more on Bluefield. So Bluefield, uh, as I mentioned, include all of the Connect Connectx7 elements inside, plus, uh, 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 plus more programmable in-network computing. So we're talking about talking about 16 ARM cores that sits inside of the device with uh, a full data path accelerator that can run 256 threads. Um, a combination of full transport offload on one side and a hardware-based RDMA operations. There is no other network that actually had that this that had have this combination of full hardware, uh, full hardware RDMA and full transport offload. There are hardware engines for tag matching. There is hardware engine, engines for security, uh, for uh, encryption, decryption, uh, decompressions, for example, checksums, and so forth. So the, the Bluefield device provides, on one side, all, the, all of the NIC functionality. On the other side, it's the heart of the, of the new computing platform, which can offload and accelerate MPI operations, Nickel operations, uh, storage operations, if those are checksums, uh, NVMe over fabrics, um, running the full storage client processes on it. Um, security elements in hardware uh, and, and other engines, other hardware engines. So if we see that the combination, and this is what enable, uh, enabled the, the network as a new computing platform, on one side, of course, you get the best network. So we're talking about highest throughput out there. We're talking about extremely low latency. Um, switches are less than half of the latency compared to any other switch. And of course, very high message rate. The full RDMA elements, moving data directly from uh, the network into the CP memory, GP memory, from the storage to GP memory, uh, full adaptive routing, fine grain adaptive routing, full congestion control ability to build different kinds of topologies utilizing the SDN elements of InfiniBand network. And on the other side, we have computing elements. Uh, some of them are completely programmable. Of course, uh, the ARM cores, the data path accelerator, some of them are hardware based for doing data reductions, for tag matching, uh, all to all engines, for example, completely done in hardware. So going uh, uh, a little bit more into the DPU itself, try to uh, uh, give more information about that and uh, what we are leveraging the DPU today, uh, more from the performance side of things, more from for increasing application performance. So the, the data processing unit uh, of Bluefield uh, consists of the full Connect X inside, uh, Bluefield 3 uh, includes, for example, the Connect X7 inside with ports of 400 gigabit per second, uh, DDR5, DDR5 connectivity for memory. There is a PCI Express Gen 5 switch here that can uh, connect directly for G, uh, to GPUs, for example, can connect directly to CPUs, can uh, connect to uh, more flash devices if we need more storage next to the DPU. So it's, it brings good capabilities of building different kinds of platforms or connect to different PCI Express devices. The programmable ARM cores, the 16 ARM cores, data path accelerators is inside, and acceleration engines around, again, storage, security, uh, telemetry, orchestration, and MPI, or nickel. So it's accelerating AI. It's a great AI accelerator. It's a great HPC accelerator. It's a great MPI accelerator. So with, with the DPU, with the TPU, uh, we're enabling cloud native uh, supercomputing by moving all of the infrastructure services that we want to we want to run or we we need to run in order to support more users, more applications, 
uh, more tenants on a supercomputing infrastructure, we, we need to move the entire infrastructure workload, which is a workload that increases in complexity faster than any other workload out there. We need to move that into a new computing platform, which is the DPU. By moving the entire infrastructure workload into the DPU, on one side, of course, we're improving security because you need to isolate between the application domain and the infrastructure domain if you want to increase security inside supercomputing or obviously uh, uh, cloud platforms that aim to deliver HPC services. Um, and through the DPU and Docker, which is uh, the software development kit of the, of the DPU uh, and Docker services, which provide the infrastructure services, provide those services to the application running on top. So we're enabling more applications, enabling increased performance of the data center and uh, improving security and services. And of course, be able to improve application performance by utilizing this new computing, uh, computing platform. Uh, there is multiple systems that uh, uh, are built already out there. Uh, there is more that are coming, which were not announced yet. Um, system that provide access. Some of them are, are now in the last stages, by the way, of getting the DPUs. Today they're using uh, Bluefield 2. Uh, they will probably be upgraded to Bluefield 3, uh, end of the year or beginning of next year. Um, those systems provide access, can provide access for developers, uh, for testing, for doing research on how to utilize the DPU for more and more applications in different ways. Uh, we provide a full SDK and, and services platform, which is called Docker. Um, Docker includes the libraries and the drivers, of course, on the SDK side and exposing services. So it's exposing MPI services, it's exposing AI services, uh, storage services, telemetry services, and so forth for the applications running on top. Um, usage of Docker ensures that everything that developed is being developed on one generation of Bluefield. is gonna go and be able to utilize on the next generation of Bluefield and so forth. Um, so if, if, uh, if you do, if someone do want access or interested in get access to a system with Bluefield there, again, for testing development and so forth, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I can definitely help. Um, there are multiple collaborations with multiple entities around the world, actually looking into how to improve application performance. Um, one example is work done with Ohio State University. Uh, on one side, they're on MPI. So accelerating MPI by offloading MPI operations into the DPU offloading the uh, multi-process synchronization uh, operations into the DPU um, and working on FFT, for example, FFT that, uh, that was done together, the work was done together with San Diego Supercomputing Center. And by exerting MPI and, and, and utilizing or running FFTs that runs on that accelerated MPI, able to achieve almost 30% performance improvement. Uh, with the DPU. So this is one example that we uh, we published uh, and, and talked about. Uh, collaboration with the Georgia Tech Universities and, and Sandia National Labs around MiniMD. Um, and in MiniMD, the idea was to actually take part of the code itself and be able to run it in parallel on the DPU while progressing the rest of the code on, on the CPU for, for enabling overlapping on the different kind of MiniMD algorithms and by doing that, be able to achieve 20% performance improvement. There are uh, there, there is work that we've done with uh, several other entities. Uh, there is work that is, is done now around weather codes, which will publish probably shortly the results around that. Um, by by migrating by migrating or accelerating MPI on the DPU, it's not of course that you know, we have the full RDMA in the DPU and obviously the infinite band latency and the RDMA capacities and so forth. But, move, but moving MPI to the DPU, moving MPI services to the DPU, we can better 
achieve the multi-process synchronization performance. And that includes better synchronization between processes, uh, overcoming loading, balancing, and jitter, be able to uh, deliver non-blocking operations for the first time. And that, that enables to high MPI, MPI latencies. So if MPI takes an average 30% of an application runtime, this is what we can enable from a performance, uh, pro performance improvements. By actually running MPI in parallel um, on the DPU where uh, the, the CPU or the GPU continue with the uh, computing uh, process. So you will see more application examples uh, that are coming out and more MPIs that fully support the DPUs and enable that to bring that acceleration or that high performance to the different kind of MPI applications. Um, so these are the two examples that we showed, uh, the one on FFTs that got, get close to 30% performance improvement, uh, MiniMD that uh, achieved 20% performance improvement by again, uh, running those operations on, on Bluefield the DPU. Uh, we will release more application examples uh, shortly um uh, looking to to uh, to present some of those at uh, the coming gtc conference so i do invite you to join the sessions you will see some sessions on dpu uh, deep dive um, to the dpu architecture and more information on how to achieve better application performance with more examples uh, so i do invite you to join us at a, a virtual gtc conference um, another part is performance isolation and performance isolation it's, uh, is, is, is a very important element which, which come to solve a problem that uh, uh, it's, 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 its effect is increasing as we hosting more application and hosting more users on a supercomputer. Um, you can see here a couple of examples that demonstrate the problem of running multiple applications on the same data centers. And, and here we assume that all of those applications have the same quality of service. Um, so the top one you can look on just the first example, uh, looking on maps. So, so what, what we did here to demonstrate the problem of performance isolation is that we took LAMPS and, and first run LAMPS as just a single application on a supercomputer or a single application on a cloud environment. Uh, so there, there are no other applications running in parallel, just LAMPS, just one code, one application. And we run that code over and over and over again. Um, we mark the performance on the x-axis and uh, the number of runs on the y-axis. And essentially every time we go the same performance as we expect. So you see that uh, the, the histogram that we plot is very, very narrow. Um, next, we run LAMPS, but now in the presence of other codes or other applications and we had applications that are more uh, heavy on storage. We had applications that are more heavy on all to all operations, for example, and so forth. And now what happened is that applications running in parallel or together on the same infrastructure can impact other application performance because they're sharing the same, uh, same networking resources. And now looking on, on last performance that we're running over and over again, in some cases we get actually nice results. And in some cases we get actually uh, um, worse results from a performance perspective. We don't get predictive performance. Every time we can, uh, we get a, a, different, uh, a different performance for, uh, for LAMPS, which is the problem. Now, if you would look on that from the different angles of each other applications, we're actually gonna see the same thing. So applications impact other applications' performances as running on a shared environment. With performance isolation, meaning with the capabilities of the, the DPUs to control, to control injection rates to the network, to make sure that on one side, the workload is getting the best performance that it can get, but on the other side, you don't abuse networking resources, which you cannot use, actually or effectively then then with enabling performance isolation <coughs> you can see that running lamps on a multi-application environment meaning on the one in the middle but with performance isolation provides very similar performance to lamps compares to if it was just running lamps was running on a system 
So with performance isolation, we can guarantee that each application running in a multiple application uh, environment will get the best and the same performance as it was just running, running by itself. Um, so LAMS is the, is, the, is the example here, uh, AMG. It's another example that you can see on, uh, on the bottom. Uh, bottom uh, a set of graph, again, very nice performance for AMG running by itself. Uh, a more spread of histogram. Actually, uh, you know, can lose even uh, uh, half of the performance of it in, in the view of other workloads or in the presence of other workloads and then enabling performance isolation which give us a very similar performance uh, to the to the first uh, first example. So the the algorithms that control or enable the the performance resolution runs on the DPU. It's collect information that are coming from uh, the switches that are coming from uh, different kind of devices. Telemetry. There are time sensors. There are traffic sensors. There are time measurements, and so forth. Collecting all of that information in order to control the injection rate to the, to the optimal way. Um, with the DPU, we also optimize that algorithm over time to optimize that to the specific data center that you've built to the specific kind of applications and so forth. So this is another example that the DPU is enabled. Um, so if we look, uh, look again on all of those capabilities um, in network computing, in network computing uh, provides accelerated uh, performance for different kind of workloads. I showed the example of a uh, couple of MPI workloads, and we will release more examples shortly. But accelerating MPI in a very, very nice way, accelerating AI um, and NICO the same way. So we're seeing a, a very nice results on AI applications as well, leveraging the DPU and the in network computing capabilities of the network. Uh, computational storage, so be able to eliminate the jitter effect of the file system processes running on the client, for example, um, having the storage checks and being done on the network, uh, NVMe emulations, uh, decompression, uh, for example, performance isolation, uh, that, that I, I gave the example, enhanced telemetry that enables to actually provide more services and more capabilities. And as well, by separating the infrastructure domain from the application domain, moving the supercomputer towards zero trust security. So to close uh, the network and looking on InfiniBand, on one side, provide amazing performance out there. Um, nothing gets closer to that. So if you look on advantages, full hardware RDMA, full transport, full, full, full transport offload, combination that doesn't exist, exist in any other network. Uh, reductions on the switch network in hardware. Amazing, it's reducing the amount of bandwidth that you need to run by half. Um, tag matching in hardware, uh, very high message rate and so forth. So all of those networking capabilities, but now having the compute platform there uh, and the new compute platform is enable us to actually uh, leverage the network to do amazing things to build cloud native supercomputer, uh, to enable overlapping for the first time in a real effective way uh, and the rest of the element that I mentioned. Uh, so again, for more information, uh, there are session at GTC uh, that is coming in September. It will go and uh, do more deep dive on the DPU and what people can do with DPUs. Uh, there are several hackathons, by the way, and, and multiple workshops if you want to get more information. Um, and of course, if you want access to a system to test, um, we can definitely uh, contact me and I'll be more, more than happy to help. So with that, I'll thank you. And I think I'm full on time, right? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Gilad. That was pretty interesting, especially on DPUs. Uh, we have we have um, a, a couple minutes for questions. So um, there's a question on the Slack. Uh, I'll read it out. Uh, it's from Tadeus. It says, when replacing the Connect X cards with Bluefield 2, are you replacing one for one? Like in the DGX example, are you installing 10 Bluefield 2s? If so, do you, do you have a way to centralize the management of all those new ARM servers? Yeah, so, so the DPU, uh, yes, you, re you replace ConnectX one-to-one. So for example, um, either CPU servers or GPU servers, uh, instead of having ConnectX, you can have Bluefield instead. 
So you have the full ConnectX uh, features, the full ConnectX capabilities on one side, and on the other side, you get all the uh, elements as part of the new computing platform there. Uh, of course, through Docker, the services and so forth. Um, for DGX specifically, uh, you will see DPUs coming into the G DGX systems in the future. Um, replacing replacing Connect X there, uh, so you will see the capabilities uh, on on the DGX. Obviously, you will, we will see that on GPU servers coming from our OEM partners and uh, CPU servers coming from the OEM partners and so forth. Okay. Uh, now you can you can definitely uh, define that one DPU can be the full management. Entity and another G, another DPU will do the full offloading observations of MPI, for example. Um, we think that actually um, separating the network into two domains becoming more and more effective. Mm -hmm. Meaning having a piece, of, having a network for management and having a network for the compute uh, the compute uh, side of things. That's becoming more and more effective. Uh, we do that on on the G, on the DGX, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most effective way to run large infrastructures and, and large cloud environment and so forth. So yes, in this in this way, you can actually have also the DPU as uh, a separate network for orchestrating the mm -hmm. data center, orchestrating the server, uh, and another DPU for actually moving and, and, and running all the compute network with all the in-network computing capabilities. Okay, that makes sense. So thank you for you know, coming to speak to us and just going to choose the next speaker, send a video. Thank you, Gilad. Thank you very much.